Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. The message of God is the message of His love and forgiveness and offer to all of us to be part of His kingdom. This message is for Jews and Gentiles alike. And today, as we study Acts 13, we'll see how God sends the apostles throughout the region announcing this message to the world. Well, hello again. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And you are listening to our daily podcast that's going through each of the key chapters of the Bible, one per day. Today, we're in Acts chapter 13. So let's get on to Acts chapter 13. We're now in the spring of somewhere between 46 and 48 AD. Verse 1 tells us that what's about to happen is in a city of Antioch. Now, Antioch was a significant city up in the northern, eastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea. It was was far north of Israel. It would be in the southern part of modern-day Turkey today. In fact, I'm going to be referring to this whole region as Turkey, even though back then it was divided into various regions. Antioch itself was an important city in the book of Acts. It's already been lightly referenced in Acts chapter 6, and then it's going to be heavily spoken about in Acts chapter 11. We skipped Acts chapter 11. But in Acts chapter 11, it talks about how some of Christ's people who were Jewish had come from the island of Cyprus and Cyrene to Antioch to tell the Greek people in Antioch about Jesus. And so even at that point, we're seeing that there are Jewish people who are bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. It says that a large number of people believed in the Lord and turned to him. And that's when church leaders in Jerusalem heard about this. And they send Barnabas to Antioch where he went and confirmed God's work among them to encourage them all to be resolute in their obedience to the Lord. And then under Barnabas' teaching, even more people come to Christ. Again, this is all in Acts chapter 11. And so Barnabas leaves Antioch, and he just leaves for a little while. He goes to Tarsus to look for Paul, finds Paul, and brings him back to Antioch. Now, why does Barnabas go and get Paul? Well, we don't know. However, this church in Antioch is a mixture of Jews and Gentiles together. Remember, Barnabas was a Jewish Levite. He was a devout follower of Christ. He is from Cyprus, which is also a Greek region as well. And so perhaps he saw how important it was that this church be led by someone who could work with both Jews and Gentiles and minister to both. And who better than for a converted Pharisee who was from a Greek city that really wasn't that far from Antioch. And so Barnabas decides that Paul's the man for this job and he goes to Tarsus, gets him, brings him back to Antioch and chapter 11 says they spend a year there strengthening the churches. Well, now that brings us to chapter 13 and the opening scene, which is here taking place in Antioch. Now, if you've read Acts 13 already, or if you have the Bible open with you and you're just kind of glancing at it right now, these opening verses, we find this church here fasting and praying and serving the Lord. They're seeking him and his will. They want to know what he wants them to do. And the Holy Spirit tells them in verse 2, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Now, what is this work? Well, if you turn in your Bibles back to Acts chapter 9, verse 15, This was the Lord's message to Ananias about Paul. In Acts 9.15, the Lord says to Ananias, Go to Ananias, for he, Paul or Saul, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. And so from the day that Paul was converted, God had set him apart to bring the gospel to Gentiles, to kings, and to the Jewish people. And so here we are back in Acts chapter 13. Here it's in verse 2. And God is telling them to basically release Paul to carry out God's will in his life. And so in verse 3, they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on Paul and Barnabas and then sent them on what we would call the first missionary journey, the first one ever done by any missionary. And so now we start to see the outworking of God's plan for the early church. All along, God has intended for his people to carry this message of the gospel throughout the world. And Paul is just the first of countless missionaries throughout history who has taken the message of the kingdom to the world around them. And so Acts chapter 13 and 14 gives us an overview of what this first journey looked like. So where is this missionary trip going to take them? Well, in broad strokes, Acts 13 contains the journey outward towards Derby. They don't actually make it to Derby in Acts 13. They make it there in Acts 14. But basically, Acts 13 is the journey outward. Acts 14 is the journey back to Antioch. And so their journey starts with them sailing westward towards Barnabas' home island of Cyprus. Then they leave there. They go northward to the shores of southern Turkey. And then they go into the interior of Turkey. And they kind of go around there for a while. Then they come back the way they came. And so that's where they went. And that's now where we're going to go as we follow their journey along with them. So let's go on in Acts 13 to verse 4. Verse 4 says they started their journey via boat leaving from Seleucia. 
Now, Antioch wasn't exactly on the coast, so they had to go about 16 miles to the shore. They set sail from there to the island of Cyprus. When they arrive at Cyprus, they land on the eastern side of the island in a city called Salmis, and they soon begin to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues. Now, we could just surmise there was many Jews on this island and the lots of synagogues. And God's hand is in all of these details, because in Acts chapter 4, we learn that Barnabas was a Levite from Cyprus. And so Barnabas would have known this island, maybe even known the synagogues, maybe even taught in a couple of the past. And so they show on up. He, he speaks the, the accent of them. He knows the region. And as we see in verse 4, he and Paul are able to explain the word of God. And we're also going to find that out when Luke says that Paul was proclaiming the word of God, he means that Paul was proclaiming the gospel. And we'll see that as we get to the end of the chapter here. Now, we should notice as we go on in this passage here, verse 5 mentions that John was there as a helper. Now, who's this John guy? Well, John is also known as Mark, as in the, the author of the Gospel of Mark. Colossians 4.10 tells us that Mark is the cousin of Barnabas. And so on this first leg of their first missionary trip, John Mark, as he's sometimes called, is part of the work that they're doing for the Gospel. And so the three of them are working across this island of Cyprus, and they're going from synagogue to synagogue with the Gospel. The island of Cyprus is large, but it's not huge. It's, it's a bit smaller than the big island of Hawaii. So it's going to take days to traverse, but not months. And so eventually they come to the city of Paphos, which is on the western side of the island. Now, Paphos was the seat of the Roman government of the island. If you think about it, Italy's on the western side of Cyprus. And so you just kind of, you sail from Italy, you land on the western side, and that would just be the place that they would naturally set up their governmental offices and things like that. And so the city of Paphos is also where the governor of the island lived. He's called the proconsul in verse 7. And, and so he's based out of Paphos. And so Paul and Barnabas have now come to Paphos. And so in verse 7, the proconsul, this governor of the entire island, calls for Paul and Barnabas because he wants to hear what they're saying. Now, this might be a good thing. Maybe not. We'll, we'll find on out. The thing is, there's also a Jewish magician in Paphos named Elimus. And Elimus was this Jewish magician, which isn't really saying much. He basically did fake tricks to try to convince people he was something to listen to. And so Elimus doesn't want the proconsul to listen to Paul and Barnabas. And so he's just trying to turn the proconsul away from Paul and Barnabas to, to just don't listen to those guys. But since this guy was interfering with the work of God, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul declares that he would go blind for a while, and he does. And the proconsul sees this, and he puts his faith in the Lord, and that's pretty cool. Now, before we leave the island of Cyprus, we should also notice I've been calling Paul, Paul this whole time, but verse 9 actually tells us that Saul was also known as Paul, and Luke then, from here on out, will refer to him as Paul for the rest of the book of Acts, unless he's referring to the events surrounding Paul's conversion, and then he goes back to Saul. So we're going to stop calling him Saul, Paul, we'll just call him Paul from here on out. Well, going on in verse 13, after all of this is done, in verse 13, they set sail again, and now they head north to the southern coast of modern Turkey, to a coastal town of Perga. Now, for whatever reason, their companion, John Mark, he heads back to Jerusalem. And this is going to be a big deal later on in Acts 15. And in Acts 15, verse 38, Paul is going to describe John Mark's departure here as desertion. And so something not good is going on here. We don't know what it is, but we do know that John Mark leaves them. He leaves Perga. And also we know that nothing noteworthy happens here in Perga either. Perhaps this is the spiritual warfare that Paul warns us about in Ephesians 6, 12, where he says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so something's going on here. We don't quite know what it is, but whatever's going on, this part of this first missionary trip, it's, it's not a very fruitful season right now. But then in verse 14, they head north by land to the city of Pisidian Antioch, which is in the interior of Turkey. They go to the synagogue there. They sit down among the people. And just to pause for a moment, synagogues were kind of like churches in some ways, in a lot of ways they weren't. Uh, like old-fashioned churches, they were often built in the highest part of, of town or on a hill. They would try to be the highest structure in the town. If they weren't, they might make a pole to make them a little bit higher. And yet, unlike churches, they weren't used for worship, but for instruction. And so they were often much more informal than a church service would be today. And so in verse 15, you've got Paul and Barnabas in this synagogue. And the synagogue official says to them, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation, please say it. And so Paul has this wide open door for the gospel. And, and kind of like Stephen's gospel proclamation back in Acts chapter 7, Paul begins with this familiar territory of the history of God's work among the Jewish people. 
And so in verse 17, Paul starts with the Exodus, and then in verse 18, how they wandered in the wilderness, and, and eventually in verse 19, they enter the promised land. God gave them judges until Samuel. God then gave them Saul for a king. God then raised up David as a man after God's own heart. And then in verse 23, after mentioning David, Paul quickly drops us into the life of one of David's descendants, Jesus, saying, God has brought Israel a savior, Jesus. Now, I love that wording here. God has brought Israel a savior, Jesus. Paul then mentions John the Baptist in verse 25. And we're going to find out from Acts 19 that there was a strong following for John the Baptist in places in Turkey. And so Paul tells them that John the Baptist recognized the right and the rule of this Lord Jesus. And then in verse 26, Paul calls out to them. And I love how he calls them. He says, brethren, sons of Abraham's family, those who fear God. And he calls out to them saying, to us, the message of this salvation has been sent. And he proceeds to tell them about Jesus and, and how the Jewish leadership had rejected him in verse 27 and crucified him in verse 28. And, and he was buried in verse 29. And then finally, though, the Lord has resurrected him in verse 30. And the message of the resurrection is central to Paul's whole point here. He mentions the resurrection in verse 30, verse 33, verse 34, verse 35, verse 37. And he explains in verse 33 that he, Jesus, is the Son of God. And in verse 34, he is the heir to David's throne. And so Paul has established Jesus' divinity and his kingdom rule. And now this divine king offers forgiveness. And so in verse 38, Paul says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And in verse 39, And through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. And so he is telling the people, God is offering them forgiveness and salvation from their sins through Christ. Now, what are they going to do? And so Paul gives them this challenge in verse 40, saying, Therefore, take heed so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Now, that's some pretty heavy stuff. But the people were thrilled with this message. And in verse 42, they were begging them for, to keep on teaching these things. And even the next Sabbath, and in verse 43, many people began to follow Paul and Barnabas, and they were urging these, these new believers to continue in the grace of God as opposed to just continuing the law of God, continue in God's grace. And so the people are thrilled to hear this. But not everyone. In verse 44, the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city is coming out to hear the word of the Lord, which is again that message of the gospel that Paul preached on the last Sabbath. But in verse 45, some Jews saw this. They saw all these people coming out. They listened to Paul and Barnabas, and they were filled with jealousy, and they began to contradict the apostles. And so Paul and Barnabas speak out boldly and say, they have judged themselves unworthy of eternal life. And he tells the people in verse 47, for so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. In other words, folks, if you're going to reject this message, then we'll go directly to the Gentiles with it. And so in verse 48, the Gentiles hear this and they're rejoicing. And it says, as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. And in verse 49, the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. And so it's just this amazing time of celebration among the Jewish believers and, and many Gentile believers. They're finding forgiveness in Christ and entrance into his kingdom. But notice what it says in verse 50. It says that some Jews were still opposed to the message of the gospel, specifically devout women of prominence and leading men of the city. Now, I find this wording particularly amazing. These are devout people. These are people who think they have a strong, faithful relationship with God. These are people who think that they're doing God a favor by opposing Paul and Barnabas, when in reality, they're opposing God himself. And it's just amazing here, just a reminder how people can be so blinded to the truth. Well, with all of that, Paul and Barnabas shake the dust off their feet and move on to the next city of Iconium. And yet all of these disciples were continually filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. All right, so now that's Acts 13. As we think about this passage here, what are some takeaways from this passage? Well, I can think of a few. First, God calls all of us to be a part of his work in spreading the gospel. What's your role? I find this often when people are struggling in their fellowship with God and they're in just their walk with him. It's often because they don't want to be joining Christ and advancing his gospel. And, and they just want to kind of sit in the sidelines for those things. Well, we can't. We have to be a part of the gospel work that God is doing in our world. Now, for Paul and Barnabas, it meant going on this missionary journey. But we got to remember, this missionary journey was just Barnabas going back to his home turf. And so for all of us, part of our gospel work is simply to bring the gospel to the people in our life, whether family, friends, neighbors, just seeking at least to, to be bringing the gospel to them. 
And along those lines, as we're looking at this chapter here, we can see that when we are faithful to bring God's message to the world around us, sometimes people will actually embrace it. They'll actually come to Christ and we'll have the joy of introducing them to our Lord and Savior and the forgiveness he offers through the cross. Second, throughout this chapter, we see people embracing the message and other people opposing it. This opposition is clearly spiritual in nature. That's why we must be constantly praying and seeking for God's work and protection in, in our efforts as we try to join him in advancing the gospel of the kingdom. And finally, at the end of this chapter, it was the devout women, it was the leading men who were most opposed to the clear message of God. Let us not follow their example. Let's not let pride creep into our thinking so that we think we're in the right, but we're actually opposed to the work that God is doing among us. Well, we'll wrap up chapter 13 on that note. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.